Leisure and poverty. What do the two have in common? What if I told you that not only are they both deeply connected, but together they can reveal the future of the internet? Quite a bit of a leap here, so stay with me on this. What do we know about the poor and their digital life today? We know that three billion people, about half the world's population, live on two dollars a day. We know that majority of them are young and live outside the West and are fast getting online thanks to the mobile phone. In fact, there are just as many mobile phone subscribers in Nigeria and South Africa as there are in the United States. There are more cell phones than people in China. And if you look at the list of the top countries with the most Facebook users, you will see India and Brazil rank number two and three on that list. Evidently, this has excited development agencies by far. At last, they say the internet can help end poverty as we know it. So they're calling upon innovators of all stripes to build applications to enable the poor to access all kinds of public services, from healthcare to education. Sounds like a great plan, right? So how's that going so far? So I researched the internet in developing countries. So let me tell you first about a, one of my first projects that I was involved with more than a decade ago. It was in this small town in the south of India. It was an ambitious project. The idea was to infuse the town with all kinds of new technology so the poor could leapfrog their way out of poverty. So what was done? Kiosks were set up everywhere, like ATMs of information. The vision was that women would check health, uh, health information, farmers could check crop prices, and kids could learn words of English through these kiosks. Vans were sent out to remote villages to spread the joys of the internet. And cyber cafes were set up for more tedious tasks, like downloading government forms and searching for jobs, right? So a couple of months went by, and we started to hear rumors about the project. People really liked it, but not for the reasons we imagined. The kiosks became gaming stations. The vans came to be known as movie vans because they would show free movies to all the villagers to get their attention. And the cyber cafes came to be known as friendship cafes. The cafe owners they swore by social networking sites like Orkut, the Facebook of the day, because it kept their businesses alive. So what's the takeaway here? It's obviously that the poor are more like you and me than we imagined. In fact, since then, every single project I've been on has yielded similar results. Browsing statistics today confirm the fact that whether you're from Boston or from a favela in Brazil, the most popular and most frequented sites are social networking sites, gaming sites, and pornography sites. So why do we continue holding on to this myth that somehow the poor are more virtuous online than us? Three reasons for this. The first is that leisure is not fundable. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. So there was this uh, healthcare project launched a couple of years ago uh, in South Asia. They gave mobile phones to farmers. The idea was that they would send health updates through text messages. So the project came to an end, and it was time to write up the report. And the data scientists found something astonishing. What they found was that the majority of the data was diverted to one task, and one task only, pornography. So imagine you writing up that report. It would be hard for you to sort of convince the funders to sponsor pornography for the poor, right? So what did they do? Well, they fudged a little, and they focused only on the healthcare part, thereby perpetuating this fiction that the poor are more utility-driven than passion-driven. The second reason is that we have come to believe that the poor have to go through a social evolution 
before they can even think about leisure. Why? Well, thanks to this theory called hierarchy of needs. It was a theory that came about in the 1940s, and even though thoroughly debunked today, it continues to hold a tremendous influence on our thinking. So it basically goes like this, that the poor first have to satisfy their physical needs of food and shelter before they can go into their psychological needs, and eventually they can focus on self-actualization. So in other words, it's like me telling you that you can't possibly think of something fun or something profound like world peace or freedom until and unless your stomach is full. Obviously, Gandhi and the likes did not get that memo. So the third reason is that leisure is seen as dangerous. History is a great guide here. In the industrial era, Leisure in the hands of the rich was seen as a sign of culture. In the hands of the poor, it was an instrument of trouble. So basically, the idea was to get the poor to labor as much and leisure as less, so they would have less time to think and act upon this tremendous social inequality they lived with. It is no wonder that it took more than a century for the poor to gain access to a public park or even the right to a weekend. So what do we do about this? Well, we can start by first acknowledging that the poor have the right to leisure, like everyone else. Also, funders should keep funding. But if they're remotely serious and using the internet to empower the poor, they need to first motivate the poor to adopting these new technologies. And leisure is the key gateway to the internet. Look, I don't want you to attend to the poor because you have to. I want you to attend to the poor because you want to. And trust me, you want to. We all love the internet here. And what is the internet really but the culmination of the collective imagination and creativity of the users? And that's just half the world's population. Now, imagine, now imagine opening that door to the other half. The next three billion who are getting online right now. Think about that for a moment. By letting the other half in, we would be doubling the possibilities for the future of the internet. Thank you.